HVAC 360 is brought to you today by Duckwork Arrows by Smack Me. Tired of spending time designing ductwork? Bouncing going too slow? Wish there was just an easier way? Now there is with Duckwork Arrows from Smack Me. That's right, the geniuses over the sheet metal and quantum molecular enterprises have developed internal stickers for ductwork that, once calibrated, tell the air airflow exactly which direction to go and in what quantity. Specifying these beauties is a no-brainer. And for you contractors out there, go ahead and grab them by the gross at the nearest lefty's construction mark. Duckwork arrows. We make airflow a breeze. <laughs> Welcome back. This is episode number 94. Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you go further and faster in the field of HVAC. Listen up and you're going to hear stories. We're going to interview industry experts and you're going to get more HVAC knowledge than you can shake a stick at. Uh, in addition to this podcast, you can always double down your, your weekly dose by hopping on over to HVAC360.com and get join my growing community of people who just like their HVAC with an extra shot of refrigerant. So what's up for this week? Um, well, I guess uh, a little exp explanation. I seem to have taken the entire month of July off after having a great start at the beginning of the year. So a little couple of vacations. So I'm getting behind the mic again to get this out to you. Uh, this week, I'm really super excited. We're talking with Robert Bean. He's a building environment uh, evangelists, and he really knows his stuff about building science and radiant mean temperature. Uh, those are kind of the two topics. It was a long interview, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. So part one this week, um, I think we're talking more about building science. And next week, we're going get, to get into the radiant mean temperature. Now, if you kind of gl eyes glaze over it, radiant mean temperature, it's something that you don't know about. Um, you've probably heard the effects of, and it's something that you should probably know if you're going to step up your HVAC gain. So uh, without further ado, let's cut to the tape after a brief word from our sponsor. All right, today we're talking with Robert Bean, who is the director of Indoor Climate Consultants. How you doing today, Robert? I'm doing good, Matt. How are you doing? Right, fantastic. Thanks for asking. Hey, um, awesome. for those of you who are not familiar with your work, and, and there's there's a lot to know about, uh, and they should, frankly, um, give us a little snapshot of exactly who you are and, and, and kind of what your passions are. Uh, yeah, so I kind of play around in the world of building science and indoor environmental quality and HVAC systems. And... Uh, we do two things. We have a consulting business that uh, small little consulting business that specializes in uh, you know kind of interesting buildings. And then what we learn on those projects, Matt, and of course we learn because we end up screwing up and when we go to fix it, then we now have an idea of what the problems were, what we missed on the job. and then uh, what we've learned we communicate through our website, which is uh, healthyheating.com. So, that's sort of that's you know where I'm at. I have the I have the small engineering company. I got the website, which is you know all about what we've learned. And then I have another blog that a colleague of mine, uh, Adam Muggleton, and I started doing. This. It was it was his brainchild called the Edifice Complex, and we've been playing around with that, interviewing some world leaders on uh, sustain uh, sustainability, building to property development, that type of thing. Yeah, and I think that uh, anybody listening to this podcast. Uh, you might want to check out the Edifice Complex. I think the the name might be slightly misleading to you, or it might not necessarily uh, pique your interest. But go listen to these interviews. They, you actually do them on a monthly basis, and and I, I've I've enjoyed them. So um, you've had some some great people talking on there about you know about HVAC, about the construction industry. So it's it's really relevant to um, uh, my whole audience. You know, everybody out there. Yeah, I mean, one of the I mean, it was funny when at I when Adam I've known Adam a long, long time. In fact, he was in one of my classes, and we met in I kind of think it was San Antonio, Texas, or something like that. And he said, "Hey, Robert, I got this idea for this podcast. Um, we want to get the we want to get the 
people that bust up the status quo to talk about their stories. And so we've had guys like Jerry Udelson on who's, you know, he was Mr. Green, right? He was the godfather of green. He was one of the first guys to work with the US GBC in developing that standard. And he's, you know, not uh, not so much anti-lead uh, as he is about, uh, you know, giving plaques to buildings that haven't performed as per their their designation and uh so he's got some really good opinions and, and we've had you know um holly chant on from united arab emirates and there's a lady that uh it's incredible you think about she's working for for one of the leading architectural firms in the united arab emirates which is owned by a woman uh, and so it's a, it's a female-based organization in a male-dominated world and they're they're rocking it you know and so they've got great voices to share. And we've had, you know, we've had, uh, we just finished uh, interviewing uh, ASHRAE President Bjarni Olson, who had a great story to tell. All of them have great stories to tell. So we're happy to be able to do that. Right. It's fantastic. I know that you had uh, Peter Simmons on there. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which... Right. If anybody, yeah, people don't know who Peter is. You just got to, you should just listen to the, to the episode just to understand who he is. Smart guy. Like he is a really smart guy. He's, and you know, he came up through the ranks. Like he, he didn't start out as an academic. In fact, it hasn't finished as an academic. He just had this incredible uh, gift to understand uh, buildings and systems. He was a pipe fitter at one time. He, I think he was, I think he welded pipes. So, you know, he can, he can swear with the best of them. <laughs> and, uh, but he's just really smart and he gets buildings and he's got some pretty, um, uh, coarse views on architecture and the way things are designed and built. Yeah, so it's worth just listening to that episode just to figure out who he is. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I actually I, I know Pete, and it's funny. It's, he, he takes swipes at the the uh, building commissioning people too, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, hey, now wait a minute. Then I'm like, you know, it's it's valid. You know, I, I always said that if um, if architects or engineers did what they needed to do or were enabled to do what they were supposed to be doing, then there wouldn't be a need for commissioning agents. You know, they just they just do what we do and incorporate that into their their business um you know the, yeah. so it's it's just a way that, that that projects go to market nowadays that um this is this is the boat that we're in we're trying to provide the best kind of systems for for the for the owners now obviously going you know kind of turning on that providing great buildings to owners uh is is kind of your that's your niche you 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 talk about comfort um, you know, if somebody's comfort because nobody wants a building just to be in a building. They have a building to perform a purpose that, you know, it's not it's not anything but, uh, you know, doing what they're what they're supposed to be doing. And they need that that comfort in doing that. Um, right. However, a lot of times there's a, a disconnect with the architects and the HVAC engineers about being able to do that. Now, and a lot of it stems from the understanding of uh, the building enclosure. So building science, well, how, do you, how does, what should, you know, engineers, why should engineers care about building science? Well, you know, uh, ultimately the person is the most important part of any building. You know, I'm, I'm, Again, I, you know, I, I just moved. Um, the world headquarters of Indoor Climate Consultants is now downtown Calgary. And I'm looking at thousands and thousands of high-rises and office towers and condominiums. And, you know, inside those buildings are real people. That's why we build and design the buildings to begin with. And so the building enclosure, you know, protects those individuals from the elements. Uh, but they're not perfect. Right. And so because they're of their imperfections, we need to put in HVAC systems. That's the reason why we do HVAC. It's not because people need HVAC systems. It's people need to be protected from the outdoor elements. And because buildings aren't 100 percent perfect, they have flaws. And because of the flaws, we need to put in HVAC systems. So understanding the flaws in the enclosure uh, as it relates to the human element, the human factors is incredibly important because you've got the, it's the interface, right, between what's out and what's in. And so, you know, some of the principles of of indoor climates is what's on the inside wants out and what's on the outside wants in. And it's going to move based on the flow of mass and energy, right? So 
If you've got high temperatures outside and cool temperatures inside, the flow of energy is going to go from the outside to the inside. If you've got high moisture on the inside and low moisture on the outside, the moisture flow is going to want to go from the inside to the outside. So these changes in temperature, changes in moisture, uh, changes in mass are going to move energy and mass back and forth across that enclosure. So we need to understand it. And in the process of stuff wanting to get out and stuff wanting to come in, we're going to have an impact on the indoor environment. And because we have an impact on the indoor environment, we're going to impact the customer, the client. And the clients are the best. In fact, they're the ultimate indoor environmental quality sensor, aren't they? I mean, you think about it, right? You know, we sense with our vision, our sound, the sounds, our ears, what we uh, what we smell, what we feel thermally through our skin sensors and that whole process. So vibration is another big one, right? So, you know, there's basically six elements to indoor environmental quality. And Matt, you know, I think you know that I have a major pet peeve with people using air quality as a surrogate for indoor environmental quality mm -hmm. or, or using the word indoor or the phrase indoor environmental quality implying that that's air quality. And that is so... That's like saying baking soda is a cake. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's you need all of the ingredients. Indoor environmental quality is not just about respiration. Right. I mean, you look at so again, I'm looking at the Nexon building here across from me, you know, and or the, and the apartment next to it. And all the blinds are closed. Well, why are the blinds closed? Well, the blinds are closed because, you know, we got shortwave radiation hitting the glass, the fenestrations. And, and the enclosure itself. So now you got the closure heating up, but you also got that bright light coming in, right? So the bright lights people don't like, and they don't like the heat being built up in the building. Well, and then also what ends up happening is that shortwave radiation comes through the glass and depends on the performance of the glass. And it's going to start to hit synthetic materials like nylons and polyesters, right? Well, they break down. And so now you got particles in the air and then you got, you know, gases in the air, like formaldehyde. So now we have an air quality problem, right? Then if you got lots of glass and I, where I am, you know, on Friday night, the parties start to happen down here in downtown Calgary. So now you got noise problems, right? And of course, people talk about, you know, uh, natural ventilation. Well, have you ever tried to naturally ventilate your building at night when you want to sleep when there's parties going on? <laughs> it's so, you know, there's, if there's, Designing good door environments is you can't separate the enclosure from the occupant and you can't separate the occupant from the indoor environment. They're all tied together. And um, so the engineer, you know, you got to understand the buildings. You got to understand heat flow. You got to understand moisture flow, um, all kinds of energy flows. Sound is, of course, is a form of energy, right? So you need to understand that. And by understanding that, then you can start to address the problems that people have in spaces. So, I mean, obviously, I think the one thing as an engineer, you know, you're sitting down there and designing. I don't know too many engineers who 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 come at a project from that aspect, thinking like, okay, you know what, I'm going to analyze you know, these, you know, six, eight, 10 different, um, 10 different factors. I think, I think they're like, okay, well, we got to focus on, you know, just energy, just heat, heat flow in and out. I, you know, is, is this something that you see is, is changing in the industry? Um, is that, is that, how is, how is that being captured? It's, how is that being rectified? It's happening slowly, painfully slowly. Um, we had uh, Bill Bonfleff on from Penn State University, and they have one of the few architectural engineering programs. And I know that uh, the University of Waterloo have just started up an architectural engineering uh, program. And so you're starting to see these curriculums start to include this these studies, but it's just so painfully slow, Matt. And, um, you know, I mean, I'll probably be dead by the time it becomes standard practice in industry, but, right. uh, you know, I mean, we, we've talked about this many, many times, uh, where we say, I mean, our philosophy is designed for people, good buildings will follow. So our, our starting point is always 
with human factors. And there's a company, a very famous company called IDEO, spelled I-D-E-O. And IDEO are probably one of the world's uh, leading industrial design companies. They work with, well, pick a product, a famous product, and they probably have designed uh, products or worked on the design team. So Apple, for example, when they were developing their mouse, they contracted with IDEO to do uh, stuff for them. The same thing with the you know some of the phone systems. And so IDEO's philosophy is is that all design is human factor design. And we need to start with the needs of the occupant and work out. And unfortunately, what happens today, and this is just you know the culture, it's bad habits, uh, where the occupant is like an afterthought. It's like the architect, you know, has an opportunity to express his creativity for a client. And that's really what it is, right? He's been given a check to express his creativity. And so he designs these buildings, <clears throat> and then he gives it to the structural engineers and the you know, electrical engineers and the mechanical engineers. Okay, here's my work of art. Now make it work. And so then you get all these design professionals that are in silos. They don't even talk to each other, even though ultimately the occupant who will be the person that consolidates the sensory systems, right? He's going to say whether it's comfortable or not from a visual point of view, auditory point of view, kinesthetic point of view. Uh, you know, so he, the, the occupant ultimately becomes the judge, but yet nobody considers him like that's just insane. Right. I, you know, I, I, I couldn't have said it better with the, the work of art as, as far as a building, as far as a building goes, um, you know, and, and, and it's just I, I guess, you know, you get into some of these aspects where, you know, I mean, one of the topics that we want to cover today is the mean radiant uh, temperature. And mm. this, there needs to be a discussion. You know, it's not like, okay, here's my work of art, you know, make it happen. Or it's just telling you how much glass and glazing is, is going to be, you know, on a project and the engineer going, okay, well, I'll design a system that, uh, you know, that, that does that or that, that um, you know, addresses that. You, you, there has to be some kickback to say, hey, you, do you really want this much glass? I mean, where where does the sensibility and kickback come from i mean it's certainly not the owner the owner might say hey you know what i like the look of that building but they don't fully understand the implications of having all that glass for example no, they don't they don't and and so when you talk to you know the fine folks over at the center for the built environment they had they issued a paper here not too long ago there were they had um, over a 10-year period they uh, surveyed 365 buildings. There were something like 56,000 people that participated in it. And the results are dismal. Like it's almost embarrassing. Um, you know, one of the targets, say for example, in, in thermal comfort, uh, we use ASHRAE standard 55 as, is the standard for that. And the target there is between 80 and 90% occupant satisfaction. In other words, if we get all of the ingredients right in standard 55 inside a building, you know, eight or nine out of ten people will be will find the space acceptable, but the results are incredibly uh, depressing. <laughs> it's probably the best way to say it because, you know, we're not even hitting fifty percent, forty percent. I mean, and and it depends on how you know when you look at the data. It depends how you want to sort of capture it. But there are, there are, there are cases where we're not even getting to twenty or thirty percent satisfaction. And you can see it. Like you can look at buildings and, you know, again, looking at, uh, for example, sunlight or shortwave radiation. So you've got, you know, both the visible uh, light and then, but you've also got the infrared, right? The electromagnetic energy, which is converted into heat when it hits a building, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, you look at these buildings and you can just, and, and Vancouver is a great example. You can, you can actually get a view of the downtown core of Vancouver where, you know, like 90% of the blinds are pulled, Right. And why? And it's because the buildings are overheated. They're overlit. You know, why anybody would spend in Vancouver two and a half, three million dollars on a condo that destroys their artwork. Right. Breaks down the synthetic materials in there and causes outgassing. So now they're in a closed container sucking up fumes. <laughs> I wouldn't pay three million dollars to have that privilege. Right. Would you? No. <laughs> right. But what but. People don't understand, and then that's one of the problems that we have. So there's a, 
you know, there's a, there's a literacy in architecture today at a really large scale, both in terms of people buying properties and also the people building and design are designing and building the properties. Illiteracy runs rampant in the, in the entire industry. Oh my. So let, let's, <laughs> how's that for some depressing talk? I know, right? It's, 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 it's crazy. Um, well, you know what? It, and it's funny, Matt, cause I, I just want to add one thing here. So you, I think, you know, like I, uh, I've been traveling across the country for the last 15, 17 years, whatever it's been. And I do these surveys from audiences. Like, so I'm teaching, teaching a room full of architects, engineers, builders. So I'll give you two, I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. So I, I think it was in 2015, I was invited to do a lecture at uh, Joe Steberg's Building Science, a summer camp. And then the following year, I was invited to do uh, a lecture at um, uh, Gord Cook's and Tex McLeod and John Straub's. Uh, and Andy Oding's uh, spring camp in uh, Huntsville, Ontario. Now, between those two uh, lectures that I did, there were 600 of North America's top designers. Like, I mean, the top guys and girls, right? The, these are like the cream de la cream of the of the industry, right? And, anyways, to cut the story short, 97% of the audience was not fully aware of ASHRAE 55. Another way of saying that is only 3% of the audience could actually name the standard, and of those, only half of them were fully conversant on its application. Yikes. That's, that's frightening, right? Because when you ask, when you talk about buildings and comfort and why we, you know, why, why we have these enclosures, it, ultimately it's to provide visual comfort and auditory comfort and thermal comfort, right? And, by, and so it's about creating comfort. And when our design professionals aren't, you know, aren't even aware of how to use the standards, that explains the data that, you know, the CBE gets, right? And the CBE is just one organization, but, you know, look at the folks down in Australia, uh, De Deers. And his crew, or you go over to Europe and you look at Humphreys and their crew. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Asia or Europe, uh, uh, Australia or North America. The data tells us that we are doing a crappy job. And one of the reasons why we're doing a crappy job is because our design professionals don't know the standards and we need to change that. And we got to educate building owners and developers and, of course, the consumers as well, the, uh, the occupants. There, that's my soapbox. Wow, that's a lot of education. It is a lot of education. But, you know, how many chances do you get to build a big building, right? Like, I mean, it's not like you can – these aren't portable, right? right? They're not disposable. You put up a high-rise, a 50 or 60-story high-rise, right? You're not going to rip it down in 10 years. Like, And same thing with housing, you know, like – it's – we – yeah, we yeah, have yeah. a there's – a, there's a mind shift that needs to take place here. Yeah, you're not even – it's not even feasible to, to reskin it in, in most cases, you know, to, to actually affect the, the building enclosure with, with that. It's, it's more of just internal renovation and, and dealing with, you know, dealing with an existing enclosure. Yeah. So if we bring it down that's, – so that's a good point. So when you bring it down to, say, in the residential buildings, for example – uh, the rock, there's four studies that have been done uh, starting in 2016 through to 2018. And um, one of them was through the, uh, I'm going to say this right, ACEEE, which I think is the American Council of Energy Efficiency or something. I have whatever. Right. You probably, mm -hmm. It's out of the U.S. I'm, I'm from Canada. I don't know why. Sorry. <laughs> um, another one was from the Rocky Mountain Institute. And then there was two studies that were done from Europe, right? Anyways, the conclusion on these studies uh, as it relates to housing is that when people do full, full fledged renovations, like they're going to just say, you know what, let's fix this house. Um, three of the four studies reported that it wasn't done to improve energy efficiency. It was to fix the discomfort. Now, the, what, the, the ACEEE one, which was interesting – um, I wish I had control over their questionnaire. It was it was a good it was a good study, but when you have an organization that's whole focus on energy efficiency, of course you're going to couch some of your questions in terms of energy efficiency. Go figure. And uh, but anyways, the, still the results were is that people made decisions to do improvements for sustainability reasons, for energy efficiency, but also for comfort. So there's that, that, that word comfort, you know, resided across four current studies of why people do what they do. 
And so when they start to fix things, they're fixing the enclosure. And that a big part of that is improving what's called the mean radiant temperature, which you mentioned earlier. So do you want to talk about MRT? Oh, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so for the li- so for the listeners, when when you uh, when you open up the ASHRAE standard 55, you're going to find 10 metrics in that standard. Four of them are what we call general factors, four are localized factors, and two are personal factors. Now, when we talk about uh, the general factors, we're talking about the air temperature, we're talking about the radiant temperature, we're talking about air velocity and relative humidity. When we talk about the local factors, we're talking about temperature stratification, radiant asymmetry, draft, and floor temperature. And the two personal factors are clothing and met rate or metabolic rate. So those are the 10 ingredients of the cake. Now, building codes today basically say you need to maintain 72 degree air temperature in a space. For those in Canada, it's like 21 degrees Celsius or 22 degrees Celsius, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you're in Canada or the United States. It's going to be in that range, plus or minus a degree or two, right? So the codes pick on one of 10 metrics. So you can't rely on the codes to establish conditions for comfort because it's 10% of all of the metrics, right? So let's go back to this term mean radiant and what's that, what that is all about. All right, so – when you build or design an enclosure, it's going to be sitting on a property, and that property is going to get, get exposed to solar gains and then the ambient air temperatures on the outside. And when it's cold on the outside uh, and warm on the inside, energy is going to want to flow in the form of heat from the inside to the outside. And if the enclosure sucks – then the flow of energy is going to be high. And as that flow of energy is high, then the inside temperature of the enclosure is going to drop. Now, what's the impact on that? Okay, so we need to have a quick lesson on human physiology, Matt. So it's just going to be really simple. Um, Sitting in our offices right now, we're exposed to six surfaces. You have the ceiling, you got the floor, and then you got the four walls around you. Human beings at relatively low MET rates <coughs> and moderate clothing in a low velocity environment, 60% of the heat transfer from the occupant to the space is via radiation. It's not air temperature or convection based, it's it's radiant. Okay. So for those that maybe don't quite understand this concept, put your hands together, right? When you put your hands together, you're actually conduction. Now, if you pull your hands apart, there's no mass there other than the air, so you're not going to have conduction. So what moves the energy from one place to another? It's going to be radiant. Now, if the two temperatures are the same, like if in your hands, there's no differential. So the energy exchange of your radiation is, for, unless you're an academic, let's just say it's zero. Okay, There's some, but we're just going to call it zero, right? But what happens is that the body, you know, we're about, it depends on where you measure it, anywhere between 85 and 92 degrees Fahrenheit in in the IP units. Well, a crappy building, it might have an inside surface temperature of 60, 65 degrees, depending on where you're located and the, and the building construction. And so if the body's at 85 and the wall surface is at 65, that's a 20-degree delta T. So no wonder the energy moves from the warm to cold, and it's the energy leaving your body to the cold surface that causes the discomfort. That's actually what you're feeling, right? So it's not that the space is cold. It's that you're cold. <laughs> you, the, body doesn't, the body doesn't feel the building. It feels what it feels on, on, its, uh, on its surfaces. So um, that's what happens. And so when you, we get these – you know, monster buildings with all this glass. Well, here, people need to understand this. Even triple pane, argon filled, triple sealed high performance windows 
in a cold climate like where I'm from, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 40 C, the inside surface temperature of that glass can easily get down below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So what happens is you've got all this glass. So you got cold surfaces. Now, and that's one thing. So now you got your body leave, you know, discharging its heat to these cold surfaces. But then also what you have is you've got the warm air from the space hitting the glass. That glass sucks the energy out of the air, slows the molecules down, increases the density, and now you get this cold draft across the floor. So <laughs> What's interesting about this, Matt, is that we have, you know, there's this building program called Passive House in North America. It actually started in Germany, influenced by the Canadians and now it's in the States, and kind of a circle, right? But we have people that are building these passive houses, and passive houses have like tons of insulation in them, and they're super tight, right? like point, I think 0. 0.6 ACH50, right? So these are, to put some, maybe some context around that, because some people don't understand what 0. 0.6 ACH50 is all about, right? If you take a building that was built between, say, the 1950s and the 1970s, it probably has an air change rate at 50 pascal, somewhere around 7 or 8, okay? So they, they leak like a sieve, right? You can see it. I mean, you can get, you get frost on windows, and you can feel the drafts and whatnot. Well, these passive houses are 0. 0.6 ACH50, right? Super, super tight. And really thick walls and lots of insulation in the floor and lots of insulation in the ceiling, but they're still uncomfortable in some in some locations. Why? Because of the glass. So this temperature, surface temperature, drives what's called the mean radiant. So what does the mean radiant mean? It's just really simple. It just means you're sitting in your room, you're surrounded by six surfaces. All of those surfaces have different temperatures or very likely have different temperatures. And so how are, how are those surface temperatures impacting the body? So maybe your front of you is facing a large window and the back side of you is facing the kitchen. Well, the kitchen surfaces are likely going to be somewhere around ambient temperature, but the glass temperature is going to be obviously something less than ambient temperatures at design conditions. And so – you have this difference in radiant temperature, so then we now have a, a term called radiant asymmetry. Radiant asymmetry is just a fancy word to say that you got two different radiant temperatures on either side of you, and the body just happens to dislike it, right? So MRT is the entire radiant effect on the body, and radiant asymmetry is the effect that you get from different surfaces across the body. There you go. That's it. So, you know, and I like the, the, the fact that, uh, I mean, typically, typically, um, how I describe radiant, you know, and, and to me, at least it was, it was even difficult to understand, you know, the, the, the cooling kind of effect of, of radiant just from the standpoint of everybody, everybody can relate to the sun. Okay. The sun, you know, it's, it's nowhere near us, but yet we feel the heat coming from the sun. That's radiant energy. Um, right. you know, and I, I think that, you know, if, if you've been ever been camping, um, and it's been cold out and your front, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting towards the fire and the front of your body is hot and you know, the back of your body is, is cold, you know, even though you're, you're, you should be warm, it, you still have this discomfort because again, you have that, that asymmetry of right. that, that radiant, that radiant temperature. Exactly. Yeah, and so what we do as a you know practitioners is people bring us their problems, and we'll tell them, yeah, you've got a you got a mean mean radiant temperature problem here. You know, in the summertime, your glass is going to get to 110 degrees. You can throw all the cold air you like inside of that building. You know what it's like? Everybody probably has experienced this, where you're driving down the highway. Let's just say you're you're going on a westbound uh, highway. And it's somewhere around noon, you know, sun's on your left-hand side, you're heading out towards the ocean, you've got the air conditioning cranked up, but the left side of your body is cooking. You're getting like burnt, right? Yeah. You're getting, you're getting fried. And the reason why you're hot, even though the air conditioning is on, is because you've got that shortwave solar energy coming through the glass in the car window and it hits you and it gets converted to heat. And, uh, and so what you're experiencing is a, is an overheating of your skin. So, 
You can, yeah. So you can, and that's what happens in buildings too, right? I mean, you can throw all, you can throw all the air, cold air, and that's, you know, we, I mean, the it's an epidemic problem we have today with people conditioning buildings with cold air. They're so, so cold. I mean, people are coming to work with sweaters on, right? And, and coats and scarves. Why, Matt? Like, why is it that we have people freezing their butts off when it's, you know, 80 degrees or 90 degrees outside? Right. Yeah, and I, and I think I, I, I like the, the fact that um, we're, we're talking about mean, re, mean radiant energy. Um, and if you're getting into into the industry, if you've been in the industry for a while, you know, one of the first things you do as an HVAC designer when you get a project, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do a load calc. Um, so you go through all the process of, okay, here's, here's the wall, here's the U values of everything, and you get it done soup to nuts, you're, you're measuring everything. And at the end of the day, that doesn't account for the mean radiant temperature that that the occupant is going to feel. You, you've you've missed that piece because that's not a part of that at all. Exactly, and that's you know we've talked about this before is that load calculations are not comfort calculations, and HVAC design in of itself is not comfort design. <laughs> All right. Thanks again to Robert Bean for taking the time out to chat with us. Uh, check out the show notes and links for other things that uh, we mentioned during the interview. Show notes can be found at HVAC360.com slash 94 for the 94th episode. Uh, well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. Share it with somebody that uh, you think might be interested in this and kind of build your relationship from that. Uh, also, as I mentioned at the top of the show, go and subscribe to the mailing list. Um, just because you haven't gotten uh, the the month of July, uh, I took the month of July off, rather, uh, the mailing list actually continued. So they actually continued to get messages and other things from me uh, during the month of July. So if you want to be in that crowd, uh, go over to HVAC360.com and sign up today. Uh, so that's a wrap for this episode of HVAC360. Thank you very much. I'm Matt Nelson. Helping you go further, faster in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know. 